Wonderful to see everybody here on this rainy Sunday morning. Please stand with me for our first song of praise. You are worthy of my praise.
good to see everyone this morning on this cold, cold morning, but at least it's not snow. I want to uh, thank Brian for filling in back there. Uh, if you think that's easy, I invite you to go back there. <laughs> Probably going to be the most confusing place in the world back there. Mr. John does it very well, and he's got it set up. But uh, it's uh, thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. And for uh, Bobby and Steffi, uh, for those that uh, might have uh, stepped in late, uh, Judy uh, is home with uh, seven of the grandchildren dropped off because uh, we had a baby last night, and so. Uh, uh, Mama and child are both doing fine. Uh, Lazarus is uh, nine pounds, eight ounces. It was a bit uh, dicey uh, for those of you that don't know. She has chosen to have her babies at home. And a few weeks ago, uh, he was breached, but he turned around because that would have required a hospital stay. Um, but he, uh, although he had turned around, he was no longer breached. Uh, the umbilical cord was wrapped twice around his neck. So they had some uh, interesting times there, but they got it done. God is good all the time. And uh, again, uh, he is a big bruiser. So uh, pictures to come, follow on Facebook, uh, that, that stuff will happen. Something that Judy uh, came up with, and I don't know where she got the idea, but it was a good one. And she says, hey, I'm getting myself a gratitude journal. Would you like me to get you one? I said, yes, please. Uh, get me a gratitude journal. I've said it before that, that Christians especially should have a blessing journal. I've told you about Pastor Duke's blessing box, some type of a place where you can put those special things that happened. Judy and I were reflecting um, last uh, yesterday about how God has blessed us in ways that we could not ever have comprehended. Uh, just a couple of things within the last week. Miracles. Things that I've been thinking about and, and praying about and then all of a sudden it came through in a way that only God could have done it. I'm thinking about, uh, I was watching and going through something legal, the law fascinates me, um, and I heard the term, he said, she said, and you've probably heard that uh, in legalese, uh, it, it's not evidence, just because one person said one thing, another person said another, unless you have a witness to, to back it up, it comes down to he said, she said. And I started thinking about that a little bit more, then, okay, well, he said, she said, but Jesus also said some things too. So digging into it, I started looking into the Sermon on the Mount, which has got to be the greatest sermon of all time. And the things that teach Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount are many of the common things that you and I uh, hear about in our lives every day. We're going to, I'm not going to read Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48. That's the particular area we're going to focus on. But the Sermon on the Mount covers three chapters. And to read those three chapters, it would be time to go home before I finished reading. So we won't do that today, but we will look at some specific verses. But let's start with prayer. Lord, we're so thankful that we can be here this morning. We have the health and strength to be in your house this morning. We're thankful for uh, Miss Gloria and Miss Sue who uh, are back with us this morning. And, and Lord, we just pray that you'd continue to be with them. We pray that you would continue to be with those that are on our prayer list that still don't have the strength to come back. But please let them know that our hearts and our prayers are with them and we're praying for their return someday. Now be with us as we open these verses that we can learn something for our hearts in your name we ask. Amen. Now, Moses put forth the letter of the law with the Ten Commandments. And Jesus dug a little bit deeper 
into the spirit of the law in his Sermon on the Mount. There are going to be there are six instances, and we're going to talk to, look at three of them today. We'll look at three of them next week. Jesus pointed out that it is wrong to violate the spirit of the law, even if the letter of the law has not been violated. Can you give me an example? Yes, thank you for asking. I will. Let's say a family member has a physical limitation and getting around is sometimes difficult. The spirit of the law in our society allows a disabled or a handicapped individual to park in a place closer to the place of business, the store, what have you. Those are special spaces for those that have that special sticker. The spirit of the law is to allow them easier access. The letter of the law requires that disability, that placard that is hung from your mirror, or it's a special license plate, and that is issued by usually the Department of Motor Vehicles, and it requires a doctor's prescription. You can't just willy-nilly get those. Heavy fines and towing are in place for those that park in a, a handicapped place and they are not authorized. That's the spirit of the law. So if I borrow a vehicle that has the proper placard or license plate, under the letter of the law, I can park in a handicapped place because I have the proper permit. I have obeyed the letter of the law. Now, I know that you're not supposed to use the one author, but roll with me here. All right, work with me here. <laughs> we know it gets done. Somebody's in a hurry. They got their mother's vehicle or what have you. They just pull up for a minute. In fact, I've even seen people get hollered at that have a handicap sticker, and they don't park in a handicap place. They park close to the store. Hey, you got all kinds of places over there. Why don't you park in one of those and leave for me? You know, you can't win for losing someday. Under the spirit of the law, if I park in that place, even though I have the proper placard, then I'm a lazy so-and-so because I'm not, you know, I, I'm not only able to get around easily, I need to get around, a, I need to walk a few more steps. You know, Judy, God bless her, she likes, you ever have, have somebody have a new car and they gotta park at the other end of the parking lot? Now, she's not quite that bad, but she will go by a half a dozen to a dozen spaces to park so she can have a pull through, and, you know, anyways. I need to walk around more. I shouldn't whine so much, but I think some of you can feel me. There are laws against insider trading. If you have special information, you should not be able to bypass the laws of the stock market, if I can call them that, at an unfair advantage. Ask Martha Stewart. She spent some time in the slammer after she was accused of doing that. Now, whether she was, uh, I'm not going to judge that here. The bottom line is she, uh, she uh, uh, pleaded out and she went to jail. Now, if her name was senator or congressman or congresswoman, she would have been able to invest, like some did, a hundred million dollars in the electric car industry because they knew that the government was about to announce that they were planning on trying to switch the government fleet to electric vehicles 65% in the next number of years. That's insider trading. You and I would be cuffed and stuffed if we took advantage of an industry that we knew about in that way. 
down in, uh, in Baltimore, there's a section called Pigtown. And you can pick up houses down there, $5,000, $10,000. Hey, they even had some plans you could uh, buy them for a buck or five bucks if you're going to improve them and live in them. But there were people who knew that the Horseshoe Falls Casino was going to be approved. Politicians. And they bought up a lot of property right around the corner there. And Pigtown has now become the next Federal Hill, Canton, places that you could get for 10 bucks and put some money into uh, finished you can pay three, four hundred thousand dollars for some of those row houses. And I will tell you that there are politicians that got very wealthy buying up those problems, those properties for pennies on a dollar. Was it legal? <coughs> no. Kind of sort <laughs> Spirit of the law, no. Letter of the law, if you get enough LC, LLCs, and shadow corporations that they can't track it back to you, you can get away with it. And people have. It's been done. See, in the D.C. and Baltimore cesspool, laws are for the common good and for the common people, but not the elite. There are those that can pass a law that they like that will help them. The oral law, and Jesus talked about it a lot, the oral law and the traditions are a commentary on the Torah. So Moses came down with the Ten Commandments. And then the religious leaders came up with the oral law. Here's how you obey that law. Here's what you do. And they came up with 613 additional commandments to help people obey the Ten Commandments. And some of it was in an oral tradition passed down. Others of it was written, uh, sometimes called the Mishnah, sometimes called the, the Torah. It's the written law. And it's a guide to Jewish life. We can see what power and authority do to people. We can see it even in our own lives. There is a mandate in some facilities that you have to wear a mask all the time. And we try and abide by the letter and the spirit of the law and anyone who needs to wear a mask to keep themselves safe or if anyone is sick they should wear a mask to keep others safe. But there are those that have pushed that a little bit too far. You and I if we were going to get on an airplane would need to stand seven feet apart and wear a mask until we got in the plane packed like sardines in a flying sausage tube for two or three hours together, elbow to elbow. Sometimes things don't make sense. If you did not hear, if you haven't paid attention to it, uh, we saw Christy Nome, uh, governor of South Dakota last night, give a speech at uh, CPAC, we saw it on the television. And South Dakota does not have a mask law. They have not shut down or restricted any churches, any businesses whatsoever. They allow their people to use common sense. Jesus referred to the oral law as the tradition of the elders or the traditions of men. Remember the one example where Jesus was, uh, he, uh, the Pharisees came and said, hey, your, your disciples don't wash their hands before they have, uh, have a meal. Well, yeah, they wash their hands, but they didn't wash their hands seven ways the way the uh, 
Pharisees said and hold their hands up a certain way so the water drips off the elbow uh, because what they had done is taken the law and they've added so many other things to it. Even the historian Josephus made note of the traditions of the elders or the traditions of men in his writings. The problem comes when the leaders give their insights the same weight as the commandments. Instead of a guide to the law, it became the law. Instead of wear a mask if you were sick, I'll find you $5,000 for wearing a mask, even though you're not sick or around anybody. And the pastor uh, over in uh, Pasadena that was alone in the church and got fined for not wearing a mask. Alone in the church. I don't know if that's the protection of church mice. Uh, you know, afraid the church mice might get that. Who knows? He wasn't sick. People get out of hand when they start making up their own rules. The Amish do not use buttons on their clothes. Why? Because somebody somewhere said, that's sinful. So they don't have buttons on their clothes. Amish men will not wear a mustache. Why? Because someone said you shouldn't wear a mustache. Some churches don't allow a woman to wear makeup or wear pants. Many Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians because of their religious beliefs. Jesus is basically saying in the scriptures we're going to be looking at, don't confuse someone's personal preference or let the tradition interfere with God's command. And that's where we get going here. The first one is murder. I apologize if that type is too small and put this together in a hurry, but I'll read it to you. Verse 21 of Matthew chapter 5 says, You have heard it was said. Now that's something that is repeated six times. You have heard it was said, but I say, and that's what we're going to focus on this week and next. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 21, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not commit murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to justice. Again, we have the letter of the law, and Jesus was not discounting the letter of the law at all. But he said, you have devised these loopholes that allow you to, you say, keep the letter of the law but not keep the spirit of the law. And Jesus is saying the spirit of the law is important. A woman goes to a pharmacy and says, I'd like to buy some poison. My husband has been unfaithful to me. The pharmacist replies, man, I can't do that. <laughs> my, my husband has been... And, and, and the woman says, my husband has been running around with your wife. And the pharmacist says, oh, you didn't say you had a prescription. Give me five minutes, I'll have it for you. So the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Sometimes we're a little bit flexible on those. We have to be careful. If murder is a disregard for a human life and its value, don't angry words and character assassination have a similar denial of a person's dignity and worth? as a human being. A public insult, presumably, presumably an expression of anger, can be worthy of a court proceeding, proceeding if it rises to the level of slander. And condemning the intellectual and moral fitness of one's brother or sister can put you in danger of God's judgment. It is a very slippery slope. Yes, we would never murder anyone, take their life, but gossip can do the same thing. There are people who have taken their lives because they that someone has gossiped about them and they cannot face their friends or family anymore and and, and they, they just they fall apart. 
here's a question. Did the religious leaders of the synagogue murder Jesus? Not with their own hands, but they set him up and they arranged it. Thou shall do no murder. Probably of our time, the biggest thing that falls into that category where people will, good people, will disagree is the abortion issue. There are a number of states that are passing heartbeat laws that a, uh, a fetus is considered viable when the heartbeat can be heard. The rationale for that is when we no longer have a heartbeat, if we're dead, then, then we're dead, we can be declared dead, then once we have a heartbeat, should we be able to be declared alive? It's something that's going to go on and on. But the Bible says, do no murder. Jesus said, but I say, we shouldn't even be angry with a brother or sister. Or you will be subject to judgment. The second one is adultery. Verse 27 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Verse 28 says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, adultery is technically any sexual immorality that violates the marriage covenant. Whether the wife commits adultery against the husband or the husband commits adultery against the wife. But the common teaching of that day was that the wife could only commit adultery against the husband. And then they expanded it. So if a woman cheated on her husband, she was committing adultery against him. But if a man cheated on his wife with another man's wife, he was not committing adultery against her, but against the other woman's husband. They kept it among the boys. And if he cheated on his wife with an unmarried woman, then he wasn't committing adultery at all because there was no other married man involved. And Jesus said, no, that's not the way. That's not the spirit of the law. That's not the way this is supposed to work. Jesus looks at the attitude behind the act and says it is not just a physical act that constitutes adultery, but also even the look, the thought, the imagination can come into it. Once again, Jesus moves beyond the physical act to the attitude of the heart. Murder? No, we wouldn't commit the physical act, but how about the attitude of our heart? Just as you can murder or damage with your words, you can also commit adultery into your heart and your imagination. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. The Pharisees were so wrapped up in legalities and technicalities they forgot about the most important part when it comes to following God, which is the attitude of your heart. I like what Martin Luther said about temptation and sin. He said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. Jesus warns us against lust. I might add that if it is wrong to look lustfully at another person, that it is just as wrong to dress in such a way to invite someone to look lustfully at you. There's a difference between dressing attractively and dressing seductively. Women and men both know the difference. 2 Peter 2.14 gives the following description of the wicked. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. Lust seems to ma or seeks to master and conquer, while love seeks to serve. Jesus said, don't go there. 
not only should you not commit adultery, you shouldn't even be thinking along those lines. And then the third one that we're going to cover today, divorce. Verse 31 says, it has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. <coughs> Excuse me. So to further illustrate the same point, he indicates that it had been said in their religious system, according to the teachers, according to the things they believe, whoever shall put away his wife, let her give, him, give her a writing of divorcement. He taught that divorce was valid for any and every reason based on the rabbinic tradition. It was only necessary that you did the paperwork. In other words, whoever wanted to put away their wife at that day, just be sure he gives her a writing of divorce or do the paperwork, keep the technicalities, abide by the external law, and then you'll be righteous before God. She said, no, 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 no. No, you're violating the spirit of the law, and you will be held accountable. No matter what a woman did at that time, her husband could divorce her if in his eyes it was a good reason to do so. Now, they base this on a wrong interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. In Deuteronomy, it tells about a man who had a wife. He found in his own eyes something he did not like about her. And the Talmud, Talmud translates the word obnoxious, something that she did, something that he didn't like. <laughs> wow. Everybody's got grounds for divorce. But in that day, the woman was not allowed to divorce the husband for being a jerk. But the husband was allowed to divorce the wife if she put too much salt in the stew because she did something he didn't like. Not fair. Not the letter of the law. Not the spirit of the law. BDR, before Dave Ramsey, I attended a real estate seminar that followed the Robert Kiyosaki philosophy of debt and income. And based on the income from the properties we had, I did some calculation, and, and I, boy, I was hook, line, and sinker. And I came home to Judy, and I said, hey, I just attended the seminar, I'm really excited. I, I, uh, I, what I want to do is to go a hundred million dollars into debt. <laughs> well, you can imagine how that went over. <laughs> she was not on board, just to say it very mildly. Although, if you read Robert uh, Kiyosaki, you would have no problem with a person not being a hundred million dollars in debt if it was debt that was producing income. We can have a whole other conversation about it, but under the rules and regulations of the Pharisees, I could have divorced her because she didn't agree with me. By the way, Maryland law is not much better. But after hearing Dave Ramsey, I understood that my calculations, although the calculations had merit, I will say that, they did not include risk. And Judy felt the risk, the possible risk of that, that uh, the pressure of that calculation. Somebody will call Dave Ramsey and said, hey, I want to borrow $50,000 in the equity of my house and uh, put it into the stock market. He said, yeah, not a good idea. Well, but I've got a 2% mortgage and the stock market is averaging 8 to 10%, sometimes more. Last year it was more. Um, I, I could make, you know, 8, 10% on my money. Okay, so if you could borrow 100 million or 200 million, would you do that? 
And most of the people say, no, 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 I, 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 that's too much. Why? Because they start to feel that risk. Thankfully, I listened to Judy and Dave. I didn't listen to Kiyosaki because if we had listened, if I had listened to Kiyosaki, 2020 would have been a disaster for us. The way the rabbis interpreted Deuteronomy 24, they turned an allowance into a command. When Moses said, if your wife is sexually immoral, you can give her a writ of divorcement, they said, well, if I give her a writ of divorcement, then I can divorce her. They turned it around. In effect, they said, if a, a man found his wife didn't agree with him about something or it made him angry, he could divorce her. And again, it could be anything from find, seeing somebody who was prettier, she had a bad day and, and, and spoke back uh, sharply at him, put too much salt, ruined the stew, left the milk out. Who knows? You can make it up as you go along as long as you're making up your own rules. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 back up, back up, back up. We've got the letter of the law, we've got the spirit of the law, and you are responsible for both. But the spirit of the law is more important. In their minds, it had become a command because they misinterpreted the scripture. And they saw it as a permission. They were saying to Jesus when the law said, we don't commit adultery. And Jesus is saying, yes, you do. They're saying, we don't murder. And Jesus is saying, yes, you do. And they're saying, there's nothing wrong with us divorcing our wives if we give her a letter of a letter of of divorce, but like the like uh, law of Moses said, and he said, he said that is a problem. That's one reason why they hated him so much with such vitriol because he upset their apple cart. They made the rules that they liked and they lived by them, and they were enjoying them. Now, countless numbers of, of women. And unfortunately, it's not a fair thing, but it's a reality, a woman without a husband had a very hard time of making ends meet because the society was not set up for a woman to take care of herself. So Jesus confronts them in the Sermon on the Mount with the proper interpretation of scripture to show them that they were murderous, adulterous sinners who had a facade of self-righteousness. Most of us have hopefully never murdered anyone, but we have thought poorly of people. Made of, might have said bad things about people, even if they're true. Some might deserve it. But let God be their judge. You and I were not placed here to judge other people on eternal things. The Bible says we can be fruit inspectors, and we will know them by their works. As far as divorce and adultery, it is rampant in our society and unfortunately even in the church. The numbers between general society and uh, the, even the evangelical church, the numbers are not that much different. The hardness of hearts is alive and well today. Just as it was in that time, even among the religious leaders, the hardness of hearts is alive and well. And again, 
I'm not here to judge. I'm trying to point out what the scripture says. God is your judge, not Ken Lee. I'm here to caution you. I'm here to encourage you to take a second look. When you see something that might be a loophole, what is the spirit? What is God trying to say here? Think before you act on the short term. Isn't that something that we try and teach kids? Isn't that something that we try as, as our kids are growing up to teach them to, to slow down a little bit, to think this through, not be so impulsive? I mean, sometimes kids have to learn hard lessons. I used to have circles on my hand because there was a stove that my mom had been using, an electric stove, and she turned it off, and uh, it wasn't as red as it was, and I said, hey, is that hot? And I found out, yes, yes it was. I have never done that again. <laughs> That's a lesson that I learned. That was a difficult lesson that I learned. That's not a lesson my mother would have taught me, but it's a lesson I learned. And we have to teach our children not to be impulsive, not to follow every desire that they have. We need to look at what will bring God glory in our life. We also have to look at what will harm my testimony if something is found out. You and I need to commit to be better and be better, to do better, and to be better. These religious leaders were self-righteous and they made their own rules. Unfortunately, we are in a society that makes up their own rules as they go along. The statement, and it, it gets me. I don't know how, how, what effect it has on you. Well, this is my truth. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, truth doesn't really work that way. For, for, for those of you who are, are mathematicians, it, it just, the columns add up. It doesn't matter if you think 2 plus 2 is 6. It doesn't add up that way. There is a truth, a solid truth, and there is error. When someone says, well, this is my truth, that's pretty much an indication that what you're going to hear, the following, is going to be some kind of nonsense. We need to have a point, a place that we can point to for where we receive our truth. And there's even a danger there. Because we get our truth from the black book, the Bible, but there are those that have a different interpretation, a different idea. The spirit of the law, the letter of the law, both are important, and we will be judged, each and every one of us. One day we will stand before God, and we will give an account both for the letter of the law, and believe it or not, this is the book that we will be judged out of. The letter of the law, the spirit of the law. Both are important. We'll take another look at it next week. Let's all stand together. Lord, we pray that you guide now and direct. Help us to be people of discernment. That our hearts are right with you. Our hearts are true with you. That we want to do the right thing. We don't look for an excuse or a way to get around doing the right thing. We do the right thing, we let the chips fall where they may. We pray that each and every one of us now will look to you for guidance, look to your Holy Spirit for direction as we live our lives in this wicked, sinful world. In your name we ask. Amen. Bob, if you would just play a, a verse of invitation. This is a time to contemplate 
and if the Lord has spoken to your heart, you need to discuss it with him.